This is Business Weekend with Ross Greenwood. Hi and welcome to Business Weekend. I'm Ross Greenwood. It's great to have your company coming up on today's program. The Treasurer's Essay calling for impact investing, a combination of social and for-profit, prompted sharp criticism from the left and the right. But those most critical are free marketeers who see government interference as a hindrance to development. Today we speak with the former chairman of the Australian Stock Exchange, Morris Newman, the man who sponsored the last visit to Australia of Milton Friedman, the father of free market economics. It's really just regurgitating and repackaging socialism or even fascism that we've seen fail everywhere else. Now this week the profit reporting season in Australia kicks off in a big way. The Reserve Bank makes its first interest rate decision for 2023. So we analyse how all this will impact the markets and where the best value might lie. We would expect inflation to fall across the course of this year, heading back down towards uh, where central banks want it to be. But markets also this week have been rocked by the allegations into India's most powerful company, Adani. We look at the implications, not just for markets, but also for the politically sensitive Carmichael coal mine that's been developed by Adani in central Queensland. With a very low base cost that we have, a lot of our producers here are, with that very low cost base, they were going to enjoy huge margins. So all of that and plenty more coming up on today's program. But look, let's start with the state of the markets. The central banks this week reported a peak in inflation. They also took no risk by continuing to raise interest rates. And it's into that environment that Australia's largest companies will start reporting their first half profits in the coming weeks. But it'll be their outlook statements rather than the actual results that will determine their short-term price performance, as Ingrid Willinge explains. Australia's economic pressures, high inflation, rising interest rates, rampant energy prices and household spending being squeezed are all well known. What is not known is how these factors are affecting company profits and performance. Until now, the markets have been guessing. This week, though, is the start of the profit reporting season, but investors should be more interested in the future than the past. It's going to be outlooks that we're looking for that are, that are really important and I don't think we're going to get enough information from the rearview mirror to give us any sort of confidence about what 2023 is going to look like. So I think it's going to be a very difficult reporting season for investors like that. You're going to get lots of information but how relevant it is to future company performance is, is to be debated. The story is the same as ever. If a company performs well or to expectation, its share price will hold up. Any company that disappoints or which is overly guarded about its outlook will be punished severely. This reporting season is going to be relatively volatile. Um, I think the, the winners and the losers will be very uh, dramatically treated. Um, I think if we can hold up with decent results, I think the winners will hold their valuations, which are relatively um, expanded at this current moment. For CEOs and investors, their fate will depend on their outlook statement. As important as performance in the past is the promise of performance in the future. Earnings should be OK, but there potentially might be a little bit of a, a cautionary tale at the end of these reporting season, and potentially that outlook might not be as good as what we're expecting. But certainly overall, I'm really comfortable with what's happening. Certainly the banks are looking good, the materials are looking good. Mm -hmm. And we had, didn't we have a great January? Yeah. So hopefully we can continue on with that. But in an uncertain economic environment, when companies can't be sure about how high interest rates will rise and worse, how high energy prices might go, many CEOs will be guarded about the business outlook and that could play out in the share prices. I think there will be a lot of uh, vague guidance given, if any guidance at all, and I don't think that's just being evasive. I think it's the reality that, that a lot of companies just don't know what that future environment is going to look like. But look, they're also very, very well prepared for this. Uh, profit margins are high, unemployment is very low, uh, the consumer has generally been spending very, very well into this. So. I think you're going to see a really healthy bunch of results, a lot of nervousness about the future, but corporate Australia is probably as well prepared as it could be uh, leading into what's going to be a difficult economic year. But volatility breeds opportunity for the brave and the clever. This season promises plenty of opportunity if you believe the worst of the interest rate and energy pain is behind us.
I think there's still a lot of opportunity out there. If you look at last year, small cap companies underperformed large cap companies by the largest margin on record. And I still think there is a lot of opportunity in that small cap space to find individual companies that are going to release results that uh, the, 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 the word for it is better than fear because I think there's a huge amount of fear priced into a lot of companies' share prices. Travel is one sector reaping benefits from borders opening and the return of migration. Most recently, the suggestion that 40,000 Chinese students are being ordered to return to Australia to complete their degrees. So we own Qantas. That share price has run up a lot, so it's not as cheap as it was. But I think you're going to see a bumper result out of Qantas. And I think you've got a pretty good year ahead of you as well. There is going to be more competition and airfares are going to come down, but this stock is not priced for the current profitability to, to stay in place. So more capital returns, more dividends. Because I think Qantas is actually going to do quite well this reporting season. Um, we saw Flight Centre just the other day raising money as well. So maybe the travel stocks might start to see some green shoots there. The resources sector has already had a stellar start to the year on the stock market, buoyed by the reopening of China's economy and the promise of a more healthy trade environment. Now it's time to see whether the miners' profit results match the market. Iron ore is on a continued tear at the moment, so I think they're going to, those numbers are going to be really quite good. The resources sector is absolutely flush with cash, particularly the coal miners, and investors are expecting some pretty big dividends there. So the likes of Whitehaven and Yang Coal uh, are sitting on significant percentages of their market capitalisation in cash right now, and investors are expecting some big dividends. So they'll be ones to watch pretty closely through this February reporting season. But it's not just iron ore and coal. The gold sector has also also seen an enormous market recovery as inflation pushes up the price of precious metals. Oh, look, we've been bullish on the gold sector uh, in the mining category and I think that'll continue to play well um, and I think they'll report quite well. The mining sector, their positive news is most of their quarterlies are out, so their production numbers are pretty well flagged, so there's little risk there. Definitely looking at the copper space, which we mentioned before, Samphire is really one of those ones we've put a lot of money into. Oz Minerals has now come off the boards. Samphire is the next big copper stock. So we're going to keep an eye on that and see how that's progressing as well, because that's, that's rallied quite well. The most uncertain part of the economic mix right now is the consumer. Increasingly weighed down by interest rates and higher prices, it will be the first half of 2023 when the household savings start to run dry and the real pain of those increased costs take their toll. Consumer discretionary, I think, is one that we're going to really keep an eye on because they've had some fantastic numbers of, of Christmas and, and now interest rates are you know, starting to really bite. So the consumer discretionary side of things will be keeping an eye on. So the West farmers of the world, those kinds of things. This is a global phenomenon uh, where you know, consumers, despite rising rates, uh, high inflation, they've been borrowing more and more to support their standard of living. Now that can't be sustained for too long. Um, usually takes six to nine months for it to start to hit their bank balance. And we've seen that with retail sales falling over in December. And that plays straight into another Australian investment staple, the banks. Most will release trading updates and the big four have had an incredible run with an absence of bad debts and strong demand for their staple product, home loans. The pivotal question here is, can it last? And then the other, the other side, the banks. I mean, we all know property prices are coming off. We all know interest rates have gone up and there's risk in the property market. But the banks are trading at uh, you know relatively high numbers. Um, and it's a seasonal thing. Uh, when property prices are high, banks are high. When property prices fall over, banks follow soon. So given the economic uncertainty ahead and the number of unknowns Australia is facing, the core message is to keep watching individual balance sheets. Who is controlling their cash flow, their debt, their future growth? It is these factors that will set one company apart from another. And it will be the ability to identify these factors that will set investors' performance apart. But really overall, hopefully that earnings is going to continue and we just want to see the strength of balance sheets with companies to be able then to show that that, especially the top 100, is that they can weather any kind of storm. Now, while those profit statements might be positive, the state of the market in the past 12 months swept away the confidence for investors to take on new companies. The number of IPOs or new share market listings pretty much collapsed and most companies are lower than their listing price if they did get onto the market. Edward Boyd trying to find out whether things will improve this year.
Last year was the worst year for share markets since the global financial crisis. America's S&P 500 was down almost 20%. The Dow Jones dropped about 9%. The tech-laden Nasdaq plunged 33%. And the ASX 200 dropped 5.5%. Investors lost confidence. Their appetite for risk evaporated as share prices fell. As a result, IPOs, initial public offerings, share floats dried up too. We were coming off the back of a record year in 2021. We had close to 200 IPOs hitting the market that year. So it's always going to be difficult to try and replicate those sort of numbers. And 2022, the market sort of started OK for the first six months, but we saw a real drop off in IPOs towards the end of the year. HLB Manjad counted just 87 new listings last year, down from 191 the year before. Just over $1 billion was raised, down sharply from the $12.33 billion in 2021. 78 of last year's new listed companies were small cap stocks and 72% of all listings were from the materials sector. Think battery materials, including lithium. HLB Manjard partner Marcus Ohm says rising interest rates discouraged a lot of prospective companies from listing. There's been a lot of geopolitical macro factors, uh, certainly things like China have had an influence and also Ukraine and energy prices, but certainly as far as the IPO market goes, it's been more interest rate driven. Interest rates are generally not good for the wider equity markets in particular, and also companies in sectors like technology tend to struggle when interest rates are higher. We've certainly seen that in the Australian context, but also in other places around the world as well, such as the US. But here's where things get worse. Only 48 of the 87 new listings recorded a gain on their first day. Just five listings jumped more than 100%. It was no bonanza for listing junkies. The top performing IPO for the calendar year was lithium exploration stock called WA1 Resources. By contrast, payday lender before pay slumped. I think the share price performance overall last year for IPOs, we had a loss on average of 2%, but we've got to take it in context. The wider All Lords was down by 7% over the calendar year. There were some really good gains to be had. The top performing IPO last year was a company called WA1 Resources. That was up by 598% over its listing price. So they had a great result. We also had some companies, of course, that weren't quite as good. They tended to not be the resources companies which did perform well, but other sectors such as uh, diversified financials. Uh, we did see the worst performing stock was a company called Before Pay Group. That was down by 86%. So uh, that was a very difficult result for them and probably reflective of the conditions in that sort of sector. It's also worth noting that 2021 was a record year for IPOs, with markets on the way up and interest rates being held at record lows. Some of the biggest listings included asset manager GQG Partners, employment services company APM Group and property company PEXA. But 2022, it was mostly small cap companies, particularly mining exploration businesses. Yeah, the material sector and also the energy sectors did really well. So three quarters of listings for the year came from materials companies, uh, small materials companies. And in fact, three quarters of those listings actually came from Western Australia. So for the small cap junior explorer from WA, it was a great year. But for other sectors, it was really few and far between. This year, with global interest rates nearing the peak, there's more optimism for the local IPO market. More might be tempted to dip their toe in the capital markets but the market isn't expected to pick up until the second half of the year. I think the first half of 23, uh, I'd imagine that we'd see a little bit more of the same. So we'll continue to see those smaller resources companies listing, particularly in areas like gold. And also lithium had some amazing price growth last year and it's forecast to continue into this year. So some of those lithium players, there's a couple that are seeking to list already, will continue to trickle through the numbers. Any sort of meaningful improvement I think is going to be the back end of 23 as we start to see hopeful interest rate cuts coming through. There is the rumoured listing of uh, Virgin, which may be at the end of this year, perhaps going to early 2024. Uh, it's really crystal ball stuff. We've definitely got to see how that macro sort of factors play out in the gear ahead. Now, this is all part of a backdrop that central banks have had to consider as they've made interest rate decisions this week. The US Federal Reserve, after a series of rate rises of three quarters or half a percent, tapered back to a quarter of a percent. As it said, inflation in America has peaked. But Chairman Jerome Powell made it clear the job isn't yet done and there will be more rate rises.
We continue to anticipate that ongoing increases in the target range for the federal funds rate will be appropriate in order to attain a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2% over time. Meantime, the European Central Bank and the Bank of England, both with serious inflation outbreaks, raised rates by half a percent. But even there, it was a view that inflation is close to the top. We've seen the first signs that inflation has turned the corner. Annual consumer price inflation has come down from 11.1% in October to 10.5% in December. That's below where we thought it would be in the November report. And we think it will continue to fall this year and more rapidly in the second half of the year. With all this as a backdrop, this week Ed Boyd caught up with Kerry Craig, global market strategist with one of the world's biggest financial services companies, JP Morgan, to understand just how the world changes as central banks ease back on these rate rises. I mean, it was a case of, of what really went right. I mean, we had central banks that were aggressively increasing interest rates to, to fight inflation that was at multi-decade highs. Uh, we had still a China that was in lockdown and pandemics. We had concerns about whether we'd see a recession around the world. Uh, none of that really fit into the narrative of thinking around good investment opportunities. And we saw equities really fall quite dramatically in a historical context, you know, more than 20% down. And we saw, unfortunately, uh, bonds also falling as they reacted to that higher inflation and higher rates, which meant they weren't really there to protect portfolios for investors. And so in combination, that wasn't a great year for investors. The outlook for this year, is it any better than last year? I know you've talked a bit about the three-speed economy. Can you just explain to viewers what that is? I mean, it is a better year and a better outlook thinking about what the return potential could be for markets. And it does come to the fact that there will be opportunities around the world. I mean, there was a, a case of thinking about will we fall into a recession in the US earlier this year? What will Australia's economy do? Uh, in the last few weeks, we've had much better news. We now see a Eurozone economy that's likely to not fall into recession and actually expand because they've some done such a great job at filling up their gas storage tanks. They're unlikely to have to uh, curb production and manufacturing to, to keep that up. Uh, we do know that the US economy is waning. Uh, it's slowing down. So that's going to be something that is going to still be a risk out there. But, you know, even that, it's probably 50-50 whether we do see a recession because you didn't have a boom in many sectors. So you're unlikely to have a bust. And then it comes to China. Obviously, we've had that reopening that's happened, the, the dropping of those COVID restrictions much more quickly than we had expected. And so there you have an acceleration. So you've got a slowing US, uh, a China, China economy that's accelerating, and a European economy that's going from contraction to expansion as well. Yeah, the Aussie market is up pretty strongly over the first month of this year. Do you think traders are being a bit too optimistic? It's always about what's in the price when it comes to investing. And across the world, you've seen a pretty strong run in equities uh, from late last year, actually, continuing into this year. Uh, and that's that expectation that you are going to get this bit of a Goldilocks scenario. where We see inflation fall, central bankers really step back from hiking rates, uh, and also uh, no recession around the world, particularly in the case of the US. Now, that's probably happened faster than we had expected. So we'd be a little bit conscious that anything that happens to upset that narrative or create an air pocket could see a bit of a pullback in the equity market. And you've got to remember, when we are in a bear equity market that has dropped more than 20%, it's not unusual to see the market rise and then fall again. So we'd just be a little bit cautious about the attitude towards owning too many equities at this point of view. And we think there's probably lots of opportunities in the fixed income space as well. You mentioned central banks. The US Federal Reserve lifted rates again this week. How far behind is Australia falling from its global peers? I think it's all about setting interest rates that are right for the economy. We never expected the RBA to have a level of interest rates or a cash rate that was the same as the US. I mean, the US had a much bigger problem with inflation. Uh, they had a, a much bigger problem they had to try and curb in terms of what drives that inflation, with wage growth being you know, close to 6%. Australia hasn't faced those same uh, ramifications. They don't need to have an interest rate that's as high. What's important is that central banks in 2022 went from zero to 100 when it comes to thinking about the speed at which they tightened monetary policy. And now they can really start to think about moving towards a pause and actually being at the end of that rate hike cycle and not near the beginning. And the RBA is there as well. So we expect the Fed will probably hike rates again in March. We think the RBA is going to hike rates in February when it meets. Um, and that is probably likely towards uh, a pause as well, as we do know that monetary policy 
tax with quite a considerable lag on the economy. We have to see how it's going to impact the housing market, how consumers are going to react. And they don't want to over tighten policies to really curb uh, more growth than they need to. So rates in Australia could peak at 3.35%. Do you think inflation has peaked in the December quarter as well? I think it has, and that's really down to the fact that you are seeing now falling energy prices around the world. If we look at uh, oil prices or natural gas prices, uh, we're also expecting food prices to come off. Those are two big components we think about headline inflation and what we really feel as consumers. Uh, and then we do know we're going to see slowing activity in the housing market. And again, as the borders open up, we get more migration coming through. We're going to ease some of those concerns around the labour market. And that wage pressure, which drives a lot of the services inflation, is likely to start to come down as well. So we would expect inflation to fall across the course of this year, heading back down towards uh, where central banks want it to be by the end of this year. The question is just how close we get. Uh, and whether central banks really want to hammer inflation back below their targets. We also had retail sales figures out this week showing sales fell almost 4% in December. Do you think that was consumers tightening up their spending due to rising mortgage rates or did they just do their Christmas shopping back in November? There's a lot of seasonality when it comes to much of this data. I think a lot of that uh, happened back in November in terms of that spending, taking advantage of those sales rather than thinking about it just being delivered uh, within December. When I look at the Australian consumer and we compare them to others around the world, it is a case of thinking about the fact that we still have an elevated savings rate compared to what we see, say, in the US where it's been used up. Uh, that's very much support for thinking about the consumption. We still have... Uh, a consumer that is looking at the labour market and thinking there are still opportunities for jobs and wage growth is moving higher than it has been for some time, so that does support their outlook. But we would expect them to tighten their belts a little as we think about rising mortgage rates come through, that rolling off of fixed mortgages that's going to happen this year. And so obviously consumer activity will slow in the economy, but not to a point where we really think about it creating a recession in Australia. And just finally, what do you think is one of the biggest risks to Australia's economy this year? Is it those $370 billion in fixed mortgages coming off over the next 12 months or is it something else? There's always been concern with the, the leverage in the housing market in Australia, just how high it is by international standards. I think we must contrast the fact that we are going to see that big reset in mortgages with what's in offset accounts and how much cash is actually in balance sheets or how much cash is actually in bank balances across the uh, Australian economy. So I think that will mitigate that to a certain extent. I think it's definitely going to be an area of thinking about how do we get rid of that deleveraging in, in the household sector uh, and really whether we see the global economy continue to grow. Australia as an open economy is going to benefit from more global growth. And so as long as we see that resumption activity in China, improvement in Europe, that's likely to feed through to positive sentiment towards Australia. The biggest risk here, I think, is still when it comes to the central banks over tightening and killing off that growth more than anything else with what could be a relatively uh, mild year for the economy, uh, but still one that's only roughly about trend growth. So nothing super in that sense. Well, Kerry Craig, Global Market Strategist at JP Morgan, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Coming up after the break, one of Australia's great free marketeers, the former stock exchange boss Morris Newman, takes on the Treasurer's call for a new socially inclusive economic model. Thanks for being with us here on Business Weekend. Now, when Treasurer Jim Chalmers wrote his essay last weekend entitled Capitalism After the Crisis, it kicked off a maelstrom of opinion about Chalmers, his thoughts, and whether his concept of a new system of values-based capitalism is practical, sensible, or even a political lurch to the left. The essay certainly took aim at the concept of a markets-based economy, as espoused by the Nobel Prize-winning economist Milton Friedman, Friedman visited Australia four times, during the Whitlam government in 1975, again in 1981, 1994 and 2004. On two of those occasions, he was sponsored by the former stock exchange Deutsche Bank, Australia and also ABC chairman Morris Newman, himself a vigorous believer in free markets. So I caught up with Morris Newman this week and just asked him what Friedman might have said about the Treasurer's new economic model. Morris Newman, many thanks for your time. The Treasurer, Jim Chalmers, calls it a values-based capitalism, some sort of partnership between government and business to try and improve the outcomes of all Australians. Now, you're the man who brought Milton Friedman, the great free market economist, the Nobel Prize winner, to Australia here last. What do you imagine that Milton Friedman would have said to this? I think he would have said, I told you so. 
I think that what uh, Mr Chalmers or Dr Chalmers is uh, putting out there is <coughs> his own sense of what values are important, not necessarily what everybody else's values think are important. And it's quite clear that the methods that he is outlining to achieve those objectives have not been successful anywhere. So he's proposing these things as if they are new, but it's really just regurgitating and repackaging socialism or even fascism that we've seen fail everywhere else. Socialism, fascism, these are pretty strong words for something that he says. He's still suggesting that supply-side economics is something that will drive the economy. Why do you think that this move is a lurch to the left for our overall economy? Well, it's either a lurch to the left or the right, whichever way you want to put it. But certainly what we see is that it's a centralist move. It's where government is going to have more control over business, over investment, over trade unions. So in other words, it's all coming to the centre to be presumably orchestrated by the Treasurer, Mr Dr Chalmers. OK, so a part of this is about trying to raise living standards. It's about trying to also have the whole notion of climate change at the centre of what companies do. But through environmental and social governance, ESG, aren't companies already doing that themselves? Well, companies are being forced to do that. Uh, the banks are being forced to do it by the central bank. The corporations are being overlooked, overseen by ASIC. Uh, they're being judged on the question of whether they're, they're greenwashing. So all of that is already happening and of course it means that these companies are having the purpose for which they've been established, which is innovation, profitability, etc., diverted by these side issues. Uh, of course, the, the proponents of climate change will say, well, they're not a side issue, they're absolutely existential. So the market-based economy, Jim Chalmers says... It's failed. It's failed Australians. Would that be your proposition as well, that it's failed? Well, what I would say is that the so-called market-based economy is less market-based than it was, say, when Milton Friedman was here 30 or 40 years ago. So that we've been going down this route. The Productivity Commission came out with a report quite recently that showed that per capita the GDP has gone down and is the lowest it's been in 60 years. We've seen also when it comes to the wealth disparity, which is obviously one of the tenets of what Dr Chalmers is proposing, to, uh, he talks about greater equality, what we're seeing there is that the wealth disparity has never been greater. Now you can blame that on, private, on, on uh, free markets if you like, but free markets are certainly not operating. Governments uh, are ensuring that the private sector is increasingly beholden to its edicts, uh, to its legislation. So this is going to have an impact on innovation. Uh, it's going to have an impact on productivity. And of course, uh, the, the, if you don't have growing profits, if you don't have wealth creation, then you're not going to have the wealth to de redistribute through uh, through uh, pensions or whatever else. So what would you say about the notion that banks, the Royal Commission, they put profit ahead of their customers, but surely it's a partnership between customers, shareholders and staff? Well, what we found with the Royal Commission is that the banks, when it came to the question of profitability, they had the protection of the central bank, which said that they were too big to fail. Also, the fact that uh, if I was a financial institution wanted to compete with the banks, I was at a significant disadvantage. So there wasn't proper competition there in the first place. And if ever you've tried to move banks, that's not an easy thing to do. And essentially, if you've got a mortgage, then again, the limitations are there. So these are institutional rigidities that are imposed by the authorities that make competition extremely difficult. And so you're not getting the effect of a market uh, if, if it's operating at all, it's somewhat uh, been watered down as a consequence of the need to meet these requirements through money laundering, whatever they are. I mean, what happened with the Commonwealth Bank, the NAB and the other banks that were uh, caught so-called money laundering? I mean, the question is, why were the banks in that position in the first place? Why didn't Austrac do that? Why didn't all the transactions go through to Austrac? Uh, and let them do the necessary investigation as to whether the money was being 
uh, laundered. It's true that at the margin there were some cases which should have been picked up, but there were questions about the technology and all the rest of it. And I'm not running uh, an excuse for the banks. I'm simply making the point that what we're finding now is it becoming more and more difficult for people to deal with banks. And we've seen that in the, in the securities market where more and more regulation has frozen out small investors because they can't, uh, they're, they're not sufficiently profitable for the advisors who would previously have taken them on. OK, so I want to take you one step back on that, though, because Milton Friedman, a free marketeer, yourself, a free marketeer, you would say that businesses should be able to fail. One of the issues we're seeing here in the energy markets right now, we've seen it in banks, as you've described, is in many cases businesses, well, they're artificially propped up in many ways. Sure. Is this a way in which a free market should operate? Absolutely not. <laughs> that's a rhetorical question. Of course that's not the way free markets should operate. Governments sold electricity companies, gas companies, our utilities to private enterprise. Could it be argued that really now government didn't have a role to do that because ultimately the markets, the energy markets here, are now failing? Is that a prime example of where either you allow the market to work or the government actually runs it themselves for the social good? Well, the social good ultimately, as we know, there's plenty of lessons around the world, whether you want to go to Caracas or to Hanoi or wherever you want to go, we, we know the, the ultimate result of these things. But clearly, what we have seen as, as a result of government policy in energy is that there's been no investment in coal-fired plants. And so they're being retired or they're breaking down uh, and inevitably what we're going to be left with is unreliable and uh, erratic uh, renewable energy which will not do the job when we need the base load power. We're not allowed to go into nuclear so what we're going to find come, come the winter is that uh, Either we're, what, we're looking to spend another three billion, I think it is, to try and keep uh, the household intact when it comes to higher energy prices, but that's just fiddling with it. It's not actually doing what the market would want to do. And unlike what we're seeing in Europe, where at least they preserved or kept their coal-fired power stations, we blow ours up. So we don't even have them to turn to in the, in the uh, event that uh, we don't have enough gas and we don't have enough coal-fired power. We don't have enough... Uh, baseload energy. Yet in his essay, Jim Chalmers talks about the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and holds that up as an example of private enterprise and government cooperating for what he says is a, is a greater good. Well, of course, the, 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 uh, the corporate sector is happy to uh, cooperate because they're being subsidised. That, that doesn't mean to say it's an efficient allocation of investment, of, of uh, the money that's been saved by Australians and or else it's being borrowed or, or being created through uh, money, uh, printing money, uh, that's not necessarily an efficient use of resources but it, at the end of the day it will have a price and if it isn't the market price then we're going to find more and more subsidies to keep what is an unsustainable situation going for as long as it possibly can. Morris Newman, always good to chat to you. Many thanks for your time today. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Ross. Coming up after the break, the billionaire Gorta Madani lost more than $50 billion in the matter of a few days last week. Our coverage of the Adani Hindenburg debacle is coming up next. Thanks for being with us here on Business Weekend. A little over a week ago, Indian billionaire Gautam Adani was the world's third richest man. He ended this week well outside the top 10 in what's amounted to perhaps the fastest loss of wealth in history. Adani's companies had more than 100 billion US dollars wiped from their value. His share of that, more than 50 billion US. But there are fears that the fall won't end there, triggering a contagion that could hurt the Indian and the global economy. Gautam Adani started with virtually nothing. His father was a textile merchant from Gujarat. He's one of seven children and was a university dropout. But through the force of his personality and exquisite connections, Adani and his brother Vinod, the sixth richest person in India, became amongst the wealthiest people on the planet. But it hasn't been easy. Gautam Adani survived a kidnapping in 1998 he was released after a ransom was paid. 
He was at the Taj Hotel when the Mumbai terror attacks took place, but was rescued. His wealth catapulted during the government of Narendra Modi. Modi even used a Dani aircraft in the past during an election campaign. But in the past five years, Adani's wealth has soared by more than 20 times. By early this year, he was wealthier than Bill Gates, than Warren Buffett. He even passed Amazon's Jeff Bezos. But the question that threatens Gordon Adani's future is the one posed by short-selling investor Hindenburg Research. It asked, is it all a con? Hindenburg Research famously took down US electric truck manufacturer Nikola. It accused it of faking a video showing its vehicle working when it was simply rolling down a hill. Following that report, Nikola chief executive Trevor Milton was found guilty of three fraud charges. Today we announce charges against Trevor Milton, former CEO and executive chair of Nikola Corporation. With Adani, Hindenburg's two-year investigation includes that the mining conglomerate engaged in stock manipulation, accounting fraud and money laundering, the biggest con in corporate history, it's said. The reaction on India's stock market was instant. In just over six hours of trading, the Adani group of companies lost more than $70 billion in market value. Adani, though, was quick to rebut the claims. In a 413-page response, the company said the short seller's actions were nothing short of a calculated securities fraud under applicable law. Here's Adani CFO, Jugashinda Singh. Our informed and knowledgeable investors are not influenced by one-sided, motivated and unsubstantiated reports with vested interests. The timing of the attack from Hindenburg was deliberate. It targeted a new $2.5 billion US share sale. That sale was pitched with a floor price of 3,112 rupees per share. But after the Hindenburg report, the share price crashed well below that. Nobody in their right mind would buy the shares when they could buy them cheaper on the market. Adani had no choice but to pull the pin on the buyback, and that sent the shares tumbling even further to around 1,500 rupee. By late this week, Adani Enterprises had bombed out to a market cap of 21 billion US dollars. It was down 54%. Across the nine Adani companies, including ports, green energy, power and transmission, the combined loss was 108 billion US dollars. Even worse, its corporate bonds were sold off to distress levels. The rates on those bonds soared. And there are key bonds due to be rolled over in the coming weeks. Another test for the company's resolve and solvency. As Gautam Adani pulled the share sale, he spoke for the first time. Despite the volatility in the stock over the last week, your faith and belief in the company, its business and its management has been extremely reassuring and humbling for all, all of us. We are very confident that we will continue to get support in the future also. Thank you again for your trust in us. Now regulators and governments are having to assess the impact of a potential collapse of the Adani empire. Indian banks have exposure to around 40% of Adani's total group debt. Analysts claim this is manageable. India's Reserve Bank is doing its own investigation, asking its banks to release their exposure to the Adani companies. Citigroup's wealth unit, meanwhile, put a stop on margin loans on Adani securities. And while Gautam Adani works to stem the flow from the losses from his share prices, you need to also consider the millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars that Hindenburg will have made from the release of its report just a week ago. Adani says it's exploring legal action. The question is whether it has enough time to see it through the courts. Now, one of the reasons that Adani's wealth soared so rapidly is his exposure to energy, including the Carmichael coal mine in central Queensland. The controversial mine is now in production and has benefited from a 900% jump in energy coal prices to September last year. Now, prices 
since then have fallen from $450 a tonne to under $250 a tonne today. Joining me, David Lennox, Resources Analyst with Fat Profits. David, many thanks for your time. Just explain the move in coal prices, what really triggered that, because it really was all about the rise in the wealth of Adani, not just in coal, but in other forms of energy as well. Oh, look, there's no doubt about it, yes. The Carmichael mine, it came along right at the right time for Adani. You had the Ukraine-Russian war start. You had the covert reopening of the world, which was putting additional pressure on the, the demand for electricity, and very rapidly as well. So what we saw was a... a a power generation sector that was hungry for coal because they had this huge surge in demand for electricity, but there was just no coal available because there had been that lockdown. We'd seen the, the industry basically go very quiet for uh, over 12 months, no investment. And when that surge came, that surge in demand brought a surge with coal. And of course, no coal available. We saw those prices literally just go through the moon and that's what happened. That brought all coal producers into significant cash flow and profit. So anyone who owned a coal mine were really swimming in cash. Which was really seen over the course of the past 12 months that the very best performing shares on our stock market were all coal miners. It didn't matter whether it was Centennial Coal or Yan Coal or any of these types of things. So it just shows the wealth effect of it when prices went from 50 to $450 a tonne. Oh, yes, it certainly did. Because what, is, what you've seen happen is that the base cost of producing a tonne of coal over that time period hadn't changed very much. What we did see then was the huge leverage and margins you got when there was a significant uplift in the, in the coal price. So with a very low base cost that we have, a lot of our producers here are, with that very low cost base, they were going to enjoy huge margins. All they had to do was get those volumes up, get volumes up, big margins, and what do you reckon you're going to see at the end of the day? Yeah. A lot of cash, and that's what we saw. OK, there's a lot of other factors at play here, but that also was part of the reason why electricity prices spiked in Australia last year. It wasn't just the story of the gas. It was partly that, but it was also a story that there was a shortage of coal because many of these coal miners had shipments and contracts to send that coal overseas. There wasn't a lot of cheap coal left here in Australia. There was no cheap coal left. Primarily, if you were digging it out of the ground, you wanted to send it overseas because that's where you were getting the, the maximum price accretion from. Not a lot of electricity here in Australia is actually generated through gas terminals. Yes, there are a few, but really we still are reliant on those old-fashioned coal-fired coal -fired power stations and uh, really they needed the coal as well because Australia was going through the same surge in demand for electricity after the shutdown. Not quite as much as perhaps in some other countries, but there was still that huge demand for electricity. And, of course, uh, you know, the poor old coal companies here... That, sorry, the poor old power companies here had to go and find the coal wherever they could or they paid up for it. They had to pay up for it and they're not going to wear the, the uh, price losses they pass it on to their customers and that's what happened. There's another little bit of history that's sometimes forgotten here and that was the floods played a significant impact on the price of coal because of, you know, Australia being such a significant producer of coal uh, that the floods meant that some of the mines were flooded, some of the uh, power stations couldn't get the coal they required, they had to go and find it elsewhere. So all of this sort of almost was a, almost a perfect storm for the coal market and therefore even for that Carmichael coal mine last year. Yes, Look, it certainly was. You'd have to say that the rain came at a bad time when, when there was a surge in demand already and, and power stations just couldn't keep up with it globally. Not a lot of the, the mines actually got flooded out to a, to a point where they impacted significantly on production, but certainly there were some problems, mainly with getting from where the mine was to where the coal was needed was more the problem. But once we saw that, uh, that logistics chain being repaired, it was repaired quite quickly in most cases because it happens time and time again, maybe a little more frequently now. But certainly once that logistics chain was uh, fixed, then we, we saw that those operations get very quickly back to normal. OK, so one surprise out of the federal budget when it was handed down by Jim Chalmers in October last year was the forecast of a massive drop in the price of coal. And everybody went, hang on. You know, the price at the time was just off $450 US a tonne. But it is fair to say that there has been really a very sharp sell-off 
in that price of coal since then, now sitting under $250 US a tonne for thermal coal, the stuff that generates the electricity. Yeah, look, that's certainly the case. And you think about it, that, what, that is what we're going to see happen. What happens when we see a huge uplift in prices? Everybody finds and digs up coal. Mm. And that's what we saw happening. The logistics change through the, the reopening of the, of the world started to normalise. The, U- the Ukraine war, as it's gone on and on and on and, and almost become part of life, unfortunately, you know, the logistics chain around that became normalised. So once that normalises, the prices have only got one way to go. Oh, we can now get coal, they go down. But you've got to remember, they're still significantly off where they were prior to COVID yes. and prior to the start of the UK. Well, remember war. people said there, there would be no more coal mines, there would be no more coal. It wouldn't, you know, the whole industry was going to die. They wouldn't be able to get finance. But the reality is that the world needed the electricity, the world needed the coal. So even in Germany, they were looking to reopen coal-fired power stations. In China, which clearly had had a ban on Australian coal, suddenly realised its shortfall meant it turned over that decision and started to take back Australian coal. So all of these things were driven by necessity for power and relatively cheap power. Yep, they sure were. Without that... Without that demand for power, that surge for power, we wouldn't have seen any of this. But, of course, it's come along and coal coal companies are taking advantage of it. And why not? Because they may not have a long life history. In in 30 or 40 years' time, there may not be too many coal-fired power stations around and there will be probably fewer coal mines. So what do you do? You make hay when the hay's there to be made. So that's what we're seeing happening. And we're seeing companies like Whitehaven, who was... Not that long ago, a basket case in yeah. terms of companies. Now it's it's a darling. Yeah. It's swimming in cash. So it, it, how quickly a change in the underlying commodity can change the fortunes of... Which is why that Carmichael mine is so apolitically sensitive but economically sensitive because it has been developed. It is shipping coal now on the railway. So the whole point about this was it may have been scaled back from where they originally intended it, but it's producing the coal. That's one of the things, because getting a new coal mine out there is a tough thing these days. It sure is. And the fact that it's producing coal, it's producing it at a pretty good cost, even though it has had its sort of its tail chopped off a bit, yeah, is still making significant money, even at the level where the coal price is at the moment. So you'd be pretty happy if you were a Dani, yes. You'd be even happier at $400, but you know, why complain when you're still making you know, very good margins? Now, I guess the interesting question is going to be the need for capital in the future as they try and expand that mine, and just a Dani situation at that time is going to come into question as well. David Lennox, uh, always great to chat to you from Fat Profits. Thanks, Many thanks for your time today. So that's it for the program this Sunday. Up next is all the latest news right here on Sky News. Business Weekend returns next Sunday. And don't forget, you can keep up to date with all the latest business news with our daily program, Business Now, 4.30pm Eastern Time and also via our website, skynews.com.au. Thanks for your company today. I'm Ross Greenwood. We'll see you next week.